Johnny Mac, M.D., is Professor of Psychiatry, Harvard Medical School at the Cambridge Health Alliance. He is a graduate of the Boston uh, Psychoanalytic Society and Institute. He is board certified in child and adult psychoanalysis with over 40 years of clinical psychiatric education and experience. Dr. Mack has continued to teach trainees in psychiatry throughout his career. He has applied uh, the insights of depth of psychology to address the roots of the Cold War, global ecological crisis, I was just talking about that, ethno-nationalism, and other collective phenomena that inform our understanding of human identity. In 1969, he founded the Department of Psychiatry at the Cambridge Hospital in 83, co-founded the Center for Psychology and Social Change. Dr. Mack founded the Program for Extraordinary Experience Research, PEER it's called, in 93 to explore varieties of anomalous experience. Dr. Mack is the author and or co-author of 10 books, including A Prince of Our Disorder, a Pulitzer Prize winning biography of T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, right? Abduction and Nightmares and Human Conflict, his latest book, Passport to the Cosmos, Human Transformation and Alien Encounters, was published in November of 99, released in a trade paperback edition in November of 2000. He's written more than 150 scholarly articles. Oh my. What blew me away uh, absolutely about his appearance tonight was reading the jacket of his book. As you know, or he may not know, we've been dealing with this issue of people seeing things that they've never seen before in ever-growing, exponentially growing numbers. These shadow people uh, from the corner of the eye and peripheral vision, now people seeing them full on. Entities that people have never seen before, ghosts that people have never seen before. All of these things as though a veil or something were lifting. And you read a little bit of the jacket of his book, my God, it's just, it's, it's, it, it's not a setup, folks. Let me read a little bit from the jacket. In his groundbreaking follow-up to the uh, best-selling abduction Pulitzer Prize uh, winner John E. Mack, MD, powerfully demonstrates how the alien abduction phenomena calls for a revolutionary new way of examining the nature of reality and our place in the cosmos. Harvard professor John Mack stunned the world when he first published Abduction, the astonishing results of his extensive research involving clients who reported that they'd had encounters with alien life forms in Passport to the Cosmos. Mack, who has done additional research with abductees in the U.S. and around the world, provocatively asserts that this phenomenon is part of a new era in human consciousness, a time in which we must be willing to embrace the idea that alien visitation is real on some level. And he goes on to talk about people who are seeing things that they've not seen before, a change in human consciousness. So it's kind of right down the alley of where we've been lately. Dr. Mack, welcome. It's nice to be on your show again, Art. Good to have you. Um, at the beginning, I said that you are revered in, in a number of communities, certainly the, the academic community. Revered and reviled, I think. Well, yeah, yeah, that's right. But that's because of uh, being revered in ufology, uh, being revered uh, you know, in the paranormal community. All of these don't mix real well, do they? Well, it depends where you're positioned, I suppose. I mean, there are people that just uh, leave the whole academic world because it uh, puts certain kinds of demands that uh, they they don't want to have to deal with and I I completely understand that I I've stayed within it because I I think that the uh sooner or later uh, the mainstream of the culture needs to wake up uh as well as the people that are already uh awake so um but it's uh you know it's it's an it's a conservative part of our culture and and I think properly so I mean I, I think that uh, the, the academia stands for certain criteria of uh, excellence and science of evidence and I think that's quite legitimate well professor um, your academic uh, credentials in a big crisis for you were challenged uh, by Harvard and 
Uh, I talked to, I, I said a few minutes ago on the telephone, uh, just before we got on the air, that I had spoken to your lawyer, and you said, what lawyer? And uh, I said, well, the, the man who helped you or represented you uh, when you were in that crisis, and his name is... Oh, Danny Sheehan, you're talking about. And Danny yeah. Sheehan, right. Yeah. No, I mean, when I, I, I was thinking about, like, now, you know, lawyer, this was a few years back that he and I worked together on that. On, a, on my case, as they say. Right. Well, when I spoke to Danny Sheehan about your case and that fight, he said, you know, I wanted... Now, maybe he was speaking only for himself, or maybe he was speaking for you, you can tell me, but he said, what, what I wanted was, in essence, a trial. In other words, a, a full hearing where you bring all kinds of people forward to support your side of the argument. And he said, when they harvard learned that it, that's what was coming, they decided they'd rather not do it. And that's when everything, you know, backed away and got better. Um, is that characterization in your uh, estimation accurate? And uh, is it? Let me step back, because I think a lot of people that uh, are listening to, to your program aren't familiar at all with what happened, uh, what my uh, this trial thing that I went through is about. Tell them. Um, when I... Uh, I, uh, when Abduction, my first book on this subject, was published in 1994, uh, I had rather naively uh, thought that uh, my I, I tried to make as careful documentation of, of uh, 13 people that I had worked with quite intensively who had had these encounters, and I basically said, you know, this I don't, this may not fit our notions of reality, but these people are telling the truth. There's nothing clinically that can I know that can account for this, and there's some kind of visitation going on here. And uh, uh, and I set that forth, and I was quite excited. I thought maybe in the sense that I thought this was very important, and that uh, it would be greeted with uh, the same sort of. Uh, great interest that, that I had had. Well, I was rather surprised, uh, literally surprised, uh, I probably shouldn't have been, but at the sort of uh, avalanche of distress that uh, this ran into. And uh, Now, it was greeted very well out here. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, in, in my... Uh, You're talking in, about Harvard. In the medical school, and, and uh, so um, the dean appointed a three-person committee to see if I had in some way <clears throat> transgressed in, in Academically or clinically or something of that sort, and the, this my work was investigated for 15 months. Now, when the, uh, one of the deans said to me uh, when this committee was formed, uh, John, you, you wouldn't be in and this is you know a friend, and he said you wouldn't be in trouble if you had just said you'd found a new psychiatric syndrome uh, of unexplained cause. But when you said that this required might require that we look at reality differently, that's that's what got me into trouble ah. and uh, so this went on for 15 months uh, Danny Sheehan um, alerted me to the you know, potential seriousness of the whole thing I mean it's been sort of overblown that they were trying to get rid of me and all that I, I never had uh, believed that I, I think what it was about was to try to so the university could could say that they were holding me to a certain standard and it, well you're, you're it, a tenured anyway weren't you well, not in the sense of being uh, that Harvard's obligated to mm -hmm. have a, 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 an appointment that uh, is uh, without, you know, indeterminate uh, duration is how they call it. It means that as long as uh, somebody's um, at a hospital or a clinical base is is willing to, uh, I'm supported one way or another. I have a, a the appointment is uh, goes on, you know, as a well, if they weren't trying to get rid of you, uh, what what are the other outcomes that could have been? Oh, some sort of censure, I suppose, or some sort of uh, turning it over to to a medical board to to look at whether I had done some wrongdoing in, in some mm -hmm. way, or uh, it could have been um, you know, it could have been ugly in, in, in that way. But but uh, we, uh, with Danny Sheehan's great help uh, and another lawyer here in. in in Boston, uh, what what ha we were able to to show that uh, I simply had accurately reported what what I was hearing and what I was learning and what it implied, and 
I had affidavits from many of the people that I'd worked with, and, and we had a lot of witnesses that uh, argued for me, and uh, and basically we, we came to a kind of gentle, gentlemanly agreement that uh, I should uh, pursue the work, but you know, following certain standards, and, and involving more colleagues, which is something that I, I thought was quite right. In other words, uh, I, I was asked to put together a a multidisciplinary uh, group mm -hmm. within and, and also outside of Harvard to look at how do we study something that doesn't fit our notions of reality, what we call anomalous experiences. So we, you mentioned peer. We've been doing that. We had a two-day symposium, which was not Harvard-sponsored, but took place at the Harvard Divinity School, in which people from many different fields looked at this phenomenon and, and other anomalies and said, well, what do we do if it, something doesn't lend itself easily to the uh, it doesn't reveal itself through the methods of science as we have known them and seems to fall into anthropology philosophy, mm. history of science, psychology, psychiatry physics, many different fields what do you do with it? You know, I'm talking now about the so-called alien abduction phenomenon um, and those colleagues that you've involved uh, so far uh, how's it gone? Have they, have they come into it uh, with open minds? And, and uh, what's been the outcome of what they've learned? It, it depends who you talk with. Uh, I, have own, I have my own perspective on this. Uh, and there are, I know, still people that uh, behind my, uh, you know, behind the, my back, uh, whatever, uh, you know, and publicly, I suppose, sometimes, too, although less so, will say, you know, I've, going off the deep end or this is crazy or mm -hmm. it's not proven that the aliens are really physically here therefore we don't have to pay attention to this or something of that sort but by and large uh, I've seen a steady expansion uh, through the work of many people I mean you've had I think Bud Hopkins and oh, yes. he, he's been on your show right? And, oh yes and Dave Jacobs and a number sure. of other people who have really sure. pioneered this field more than I have uh, uh, I'm sort of the heavy that's come in, in a way, you know, uh, Newton's statement of standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, there have been people ahead of me that have uh, made a very important discoveries in this area, but I've been kind of the heavy who came in and said, hey, this is legitimate, this is important, this is real. You Professor, know? since uh, uh, you authored Abduction and all the time that has now passed, uh, are you beginning to get any new ideas about the phenomena? Uh, is it beginning to evolve in your mind at all? Oh, definitely. No, it's, uh, that this is what I find is, has happened. In other words, it's what started out as uh, can you prove that aliens are here or not has become a much, much broader canvas in, in terms of uh, what is our relationship to uh, other entities in the universe? Are we alone? Uh, is the only way we can find out whether we're alone or not, whether we get... Uh, can pick up uh, bleeps from on radio waves uh, through uh, setting or laser beams coming, or or are we can we uh, expand our notions of what an entity might be uh, or beings the, the form beings might take in reaching us? Uh, can we expand that to include uh, people who are identified mainly through the powerful experiences that they bring to to people? Uh, with some physical findings, but where the physical findings are not the predominant form of evidence. So it's, it's a much broader question. And, you know, indigenous people and native peoples all over the world, I mean, I haven't been everywhere, else, but many, many people that I've talked with in other countries and, and American, uh, Native Americans and uh, Indians in South America, and they, they don't think that they don't regard this phenomenon with, uh, as, as so exceptional because they have relationships with all kinds of beings that come from the, That's right. uh, the other dimensions of reality and, and enter into our uh, airspace, so to speak. However, what's in this culture, we have ruled out virtually by uh, a steady reduction of consciousness, really. We have ruled out. Uh, all other intelligence from the universe that is not a projection of the human brain. Well, Christianity plays no small part either. Well, I don't know where it comes from. I mean, I wouldn't just blame the churches on this. I oh, think I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm just saying. Science, science has its part. The, the whole culture has collaborated in so 
reducing our notions of, of reality to the three-dimensional world that we don't even have the the, 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 the sensory apparatus anymore to perceive uh, the, the existence of entities of this sort, which are perceived easily by indigenous people who haven't been so restricted by the culture. Well, if I were to tell you that, uh, and I, I just did at the beginning of the program, I'm having these thousands and thousands of emails about seeing uh, entities, dark shadows that people are calling the shadow people, uh, ghosts, people call them ghosts, people call them aliens, people call them almost everything, actually, um, even ghosts of, of um, animals. and all. But people are suddenly seeing more. It's like, you know, it's like a bleed through of the barriers that have yes. been set up in this yes. culture. Because if you were to speak to a Native American medicine man about this, they'd say, well, what are you, what's the big deal? I mean, I, we, I we, we see these entities all the time. It's as if the, the, the rind, the, 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 you know, like an orange has a thick skin around it. We have a kind of rind around us that has, uh, so that uh, this is leaking through is alarming people. And I, well, um, yes. <laughs> uh, but it's good. It's a breakdown of uh, of this. Uh, you know, it, I think it has to do in one way with the the radical separation of church and state, because the, so right. religion has been so associated with tyranny, uh, intellectual tyranny, and uh, dominance uh, and control uh, over the many centuries. That what is good about religion, the the, the depth of understanding it can provide, the the spiritual connection with a higher being or with a higher intelligence, that's all kind of been cut away. I mean, we give lip service to a belief in God, but I mean the real experience of the divine, that, that is, has been, been lost. So I think this, these aliens, whoever they are, one of the things that they seem to do is they, they break down for the people that encounter them the, this, uh, this barrier between ourselves and, and, and the rest of the cosmos. So I think that's what, what's happening to these people that are, are emailing you. Do you have any idea why it's happening? As you point out, the indigenous peoples aren't surprised at all. And yes, I've spoken with them. But why would the, the barrier be breaking down to people who are, uh, oh, I don't know, busy in the office every day, leading everyday lives, uh, not Native Americans, but uh, modern Americans. Um, indigenous Americans say, of course, we've been working with these beings and seeing them for years, for, forever. Uh, why, though, would the average American, tromping off to work, busy watching TV and doing all the things that would probably take our consciousness somewhere else, suddenly begin to get glimpses of things that we don't normally see. What's changing? Well, I have uh, two ways that I think about it. I mean, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, but there's some things that sort of glare at us that, that uh, seem to be related. One has to do with the what you mentioned earlier, the ecological crisis. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Earth uh, is in trouble, and the human species... Uh, has so deposited its waste upon it uh, without regard to the sustainable uh, life uh, of the earth that uh, we are facing the potential extinction of the life forms, many life forms on the earth, including ourselves. And uh, I might point out that uh, we're facing uh, this in the political sense. The administration now seems to be uh, intent upon deregulating so that uh, businesses will not be hampered uh, at the expense of the earth. And if if this isn't reversed, uh, then we're going to not have a planet to live on. Now, this fact has not gone unnoticed, apparently, beyond the earth. In other words, it, it seems that the earth has some importance in a larger network of being that extends beyond us. Now, I never would have believed such a thing except from the work that I've done, but it seems like uh, there is some kind of desperate outreach going on here from the cosmos to to this uh, yes. species that seems to have no concern for the uh, web of life uh, and is only concerned with its own consumption. Uh, and so it's uh, trying to reach us, to uh, awaken us to the ca catastrophic nature of the threat to the environment that this one species, namely us, is creating. So that's that seems to be a big part.
part of it. Um, another part of it seems to have something to do with some sort of exchange program. I don't know what to call it, but that uh, this uh, what Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs have pioneered and discovered about this uh, hybrid program where some sort of, uh, at least one of these species, and maybe more, in some way are connecting with us to create a whole other set of beings, uh, hybrids or whatever you want to call them. Now, whether this is happening in uh, our literal three-dimensional reality or in another dimension of reality, that's one of the most controversial subjects uh, around this, how to think about it, but that it's true and real uh, is, is, I think, uh, undeniable. So there is some kind of mutual exchange program. Perhaps what we're getting is out of this is some change and awakening and opening of ourselves, expansion of who we are, and what the beings may be getting is some sort of, uh, this is from the cases, uh, actual experience of, a, of another kind of embodiment of earthly, our type of love and affection and and, and sensuality, which they seem to, to lack. So there's some kind of interspecies connecting but that uh, that would to really discuss that you'd have to get into the various different sorts of species that seem to be uh, reaching us now and a third area has to do with simply the matter of truth i mean if you it seems to be a principle of nature that if you suppress i mean freud demonstrated this in his work that if you suppress something repress uh, something of great importance psychologically or in or or deny reality it 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 comes back you know, as it, it comes back to, to to appear it shows up so our suppression of uh, all life all intelligence everything that might that, that people call spirit uh, all beings all entities uh, the the denial of this uh, has reached <clears throat> such an extent that it in a sense it, it sort of it's like a return of the repressed of of the existence of other intelligence in in the cosmos. What what other peoples have known, and when what this culture really knew until the last three hundred years or so. We appear to be in complete denial uh, with regard to the state of the environment. Uh, I note this administration uh, has cut in half uh, the amount of money uh, that it wishes to devote to the study of alternative fuels while pursuing coal and oil avidly. And and this is a catastrophe. And I'm surprised, you know, because you're, you speak about west of the Rockies, you know, and, yes. and the Rockies, and, and the mountain states, which are so conservative, you would think that those people in those states would be particularly sensitive to the, to the environment and to the life of, of, the, uh, of the forests and the rivers and the fishing and, what, and the livestock. I mean... You would think that they would be that they would be particularly alerted to to the danger to the environment, uh, although that seems to be a, a source of, of support for this kind of deregulation. It's quite it, it's quite puzzling to me. It's um, very puzzling and scary to me because you said the Earth is in trouble, and uh, I guess the progression uh, toward a possible ecological disaster is pretty fast right now. At least that's the way I read it um, unchecked i wonder how long you think we have to go until we get a serious wake up well the late dana meadows danella meadows who was a great pioneer in awakening us to you know the limits of growth and and, uh, uh, and beyond the limits best sellers that, that kind of like rachel carson's silent spring and those sort of pioneering books about the state of the ecology and and she estimated uh, about based on, on projected statistics that she had worked out in terms of the sustainability of our lifestyle as we now are pursuing it, that we might have another 10 or 15 years to... Uh, but it, it's not, it may not be all one moment that it collapses. It may collapse gradually. We, it, I mean, for example, the price of fish has gone up uh, like fourfold in the last uh, couple of decades. Well, that's because the supply of fish, of healthy fish in the ocean is is rapidly dwindling. I mean... So so then we're the lobsters and we're just feeling warmer, but that's yeah. all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at what point do, you know, we, do we... Is there a, any space in there between awakening and death, you know? I mean, in terms of the heating up of the pot, do we wake up so we can get out of it, 
or do we just croak before we realize what we're doing to the earth? Well, maybe that's what these other entities are, and why that's why they're making uh, more frequent appearances. Maybe they're standing at the top of the pot and saying, hey, stupid, it's about to boil in there. Well, I mean, the, the <laughs> pe- yeah, I mean, the people that we work with, uh, I mean, Bud Hopkins sometimes says, well, if they're all that concerned about the environment, why do they do something about it? Well, the only thing they can do about it is change consciousness to uh, show us images, which they do regularly with people who have the encounters, show them images of what we're doing to the earth, awaken the people's visceral you know, gut feeling about what's happening. And a lot of the people that we work with at, at our program do become quite active and on behalf of the earth, very concerned about what, what we're doing. So it's... it's uh, they do do something about it. They they do what you do, Art, which is to wake people up, even at <laughs> 2 and the 3 in the morning. Yeah, even at 2 and 3 in the morning. Uh, doctor, since abduction, uh, do you have any doubt now about the uh, the reality of what occurred uh, to those people that you chronicled? None whatsoever. However, having said that, I, I do not necessarily believe that each person that's having an encounter or experiences being taken into a spaceship or whatever, or uh, having, uh, you know, poked, probed, or uh, also having a powerful spiritual experiences with the, or connection with the beings, all of this. I don't necessarily believe this is all happening in our three-dimensional physical reality. I, I can't, mm-hmm. uh, uh, I don't know. I, the fact that it is... Uh, not provable to be all three-dimensional or, uh, you know, I'm not sure if we went up, for example, and into the heavens and, and started to, you know, look inside, looking for spaceships, we'd find little aliens in there in, in our, in our airspace or something. I, I, I think we have to expand our whole, the physicists have become quite interested recently in this whole notion of a multi-dimensional universe. Oh, very I, interested. And I think that's helpful in terms of, uh, our efforts to understand where these, where that is, in what dimension all of this is happening. But the fact that that we're having some kind of interdimensional connecting doesn't make it any less real. In fact, it makes it more real in some ways because it's part of a larger reality. What do you suppose would happen, uh, Professor, if the metaphysical world and the scientific world all of a sudden got on the same page. What, what kind of consequences would there be for uh, society? Well, that's exactly what's happening now. I mean, in, in our neck of the woods, I mean, we this multidimensional conference I was telling you about, we had philosophers and scientists uh, getting together, and, and some of the people that uh, I work with personally are uh, uh, in those fields, and they are very much feeding each other intellectually. Uh, they are... Uh, I think the metaphysical dimension of this is being increasingly recognized. In other words, that, that how do we think about reality? How do we know what we know? What is the right way to decide whether somebody's telling the truth or not? Do we? Because you can't set up an experiment, you know, that uh, a controlled experiment to see whether aliens are here or not. You have to work with the people's experiences, and and so how do you decide who's an authentic truth teller here and witness? So this is. What, and that those are clinical and philosophical questions. So that's we are collaborating very much with not only with physicists and psychologists, but with philosophers around just those questions. But if the scientists verify the uh, the additional dimensions, and then metaphysically we begin to get in a good solid communication with beings from perhaps other dimensions, the the, the social consequences. The religious consequences would be you couldn't calculate them. Well, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, you mentioned the religious consequences. Um, have you ever had uh, uh, Father Corrado Balducci on your program? I have not, but I guess I ought to. He's a he's a, a Vatican prelate. Uh, still wears the cassock in good standing. Uh, man in his mid. 70s. I had a privilege of meeting him a couple of years ago. He's quite well known in the UFO community now, mm-hmm. and he's. Uh, I heard him speak at San Marino in in Italy, and, and got to uh, got to know him some. And uh, he's the <laughs> he's called the uh, he was the head Vatican uh, demonologist, uh, and 
And uh, although he's officially retired, the fact that he still you know, he says that uh, obviously what he's saying is not uh, counter to official uh, Vatican um, uh, policy. So he's not that out of line. And he says the church, Catholic church, and he, he says we have to take this very seriously, this so-called uh, encounter or abduction phenomenon. Why? Because there are so many thousands of reliable witnesses Okay. But 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 when when he said that, there was a big stir, not perhaps quite as big, but uh, a, or, or with as serious co consequence as you had in your life when you wrote your book. I mean, the Vatican did ring a little bit when he made that statement. But they didn't. They didn't deny it. No, they didn't deny it. They did and, not. And, and you know, I don't know how the church works politically. It, it may be. Uh, Maybe it's hard to understand as Harvard, you know. I, I don't know, but uh, uh, but uh, you know what his relationship to the Vatican when he made those statements was. I, I don't know, but I mean there are things you, you if you say them and, and put them forth, you you lose your standing in the church, and he did not. And uh, he's quite frank about the fact that if you have the church, when you have thousands of reliable witnesses, you got to take it seriously and. Uh, that's what he says, and he, he sticks to that. Well, I uh, I guess I guess we should talk a little bit again about Danny Sheehan. Okay. Be because he called me the other day and uh, represented to me that he had represented you during the trouble at uh, Harvard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he said, you know, we never got to what I was what was going to be the fun part for me because I really wanted a trial. I wanted a trial. I wanted to bring witnesses forth. I wanted to really do it do it up, and they backed away from that. And he, he said, so, hey, Art, how about this idea? Suppose we were to get three federal judges, and he claims he knows three retired federal judges, and a prosecutor, and a defender, and virtually have a trial with presentation of evidence and uh, witness testimony and the whole thing would that be a good idea and I said oh my god of course it would be a good idea I'd love to do it and I guess he's has he run this he's run this by you right? oh yeah we've been talking about it how did it hit you what do you think well I think it, I think it depends how it's done I think it could be a, a terrific idea Danny has uh, she and his you know, may know he he had a great deal to do with uh, opening up our awareness around uh, nuclear power, the Silkwood case, uh, oh, yes. wounded wounded knee, uh, the whole Iran Contra thing. You name it, he's been on the forefront of just about every uh, cutting edge uh, area of of uh, sort of social malpractice in the sense that that uh, has been going on in this country and. Uh, and been very effective, and he has a group of investigative uh, uh, assistants that work with him that are probably better at getting the truth about something than anyone I know. And well, what I would think, you imagine the question to be tried? What's going on? I see. I don't think there should. I, I personally don't think there should be a good guy and a bad guy in this. In other words, I don't think we should. It should become some adversarial thing between sort of uh, the the. The prosecutors and and the government cover up. I don't think it's I don't think it's about that. I think it's not about anybody's doing anything bad. I think it there are people that that in the scientific community that ought to be questioned. There are people in in government. There are people in in the religious community. Uh, people in psychology, psychiatry. In other words, it, it would my idea of this would be to get the truth. In other words, to get to the bottom of what is really. And of course, the UFO, the UFO community is crucial here. What is really going on? What what do we know? How can we find out? It wouldn't be like there's some bad guys covering things up. See, I think that's the wrong approach. Uh, I think that, that that I mean, I support full disclosure, and I, I support people that you know, like Stephen Greer, that are trying to uh, get as much uh, knowledge uh, through the government as possible. I think that's a good. I, those are very good things to do. I just I just think this the, the ring of trial tribunal should should not convey that what he's trying to do is to put some person or some group on trial. No, rather, no, no, no. But rather no, no. have a, an open forum that would create uh, 
uh, a, a way of, of bringing witnesses forward to get at the real facts of this whole UFO encounter. Yes, but obviously, domain. for balance and for consideration of the federal judges, there would have to be one side which would be uh, presenting the, I suppose, skeptical side, huh? Sure, exactly. Exactly. So you'd have people that uh, would say, no, there's nothing going on here, and uh, this is all a figment of people's imagination, and uh, then you'd have the evidence presented, and it could be quite extraordinary. What would you bring to such an event? What would who bring? You. Me personally? If you, if you were asked to uh, either testify personally as an expert or to bring witnesses, would you be able to do that? Yeah, in other words, I would, I would take uh, uh, not just the arguments or the, the case, so to speak, as I tend to make it in my books or in talking here, but I would uh, try to select certain individuals that have had the encounters and have them present their experiences and why they took it so seriously and how it affected their lives and so that the fact that we're dealing with plausible by and large healthy normal people from all parts of the society that this would get across and and so I would be in, I would be the person that one of the people that would support the truth of the encounter uh, the encounter the facts of the encounters that that are going on just uh, curious, and I suppose you'd be biased, but how would you uh, imagine the result of such a confrontation? And it would be uh, aired either on radio or television or somewhere. Uh, we don't know yet. Sure. How would you imagine it would end up? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, I think it would uh, it would be enlightening. I mean, I think it would... Uh, it, it, first of all, there is this idea uh, quite prevalent in the country that, that people are too skittish. The people, it would be too dangerous for the people to... Professor Mack, we were talking about Americans and whether they would um, accept uh, uh, the concept of a, a radical change. Uh, scientists all the time are saying, well, we, we thought we knew, but now we think. Uh, we're hearing that all the time. So it could change, and metaphysics and science could come together, and there could be a whole new reality. But, you know, it's a lot like the Brookings Institution study of what would happen if we were confronted uh, suddenly with the presence of aliens and what would happen uh, from a societal point of view. Uh, it could be very, very disturbing, or at least that's what they concluded then. Has that changed? It depends how you ask the questions. I mean, I, 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 if, you, if you ask... Uh People, do they want to know? Would they? Do they wish to have facts covered up uh, that are known by scientists or by uh, government officials? People are much more likely to say, "We want to know." If you say, uh, you know, would you be alarmed if aliens showed up here, there, and the other place? They, they might be alarmed. I mean, first of all, the as far as I can tell, uh, the aliens with all the and not every in encounter is a pleasant one. People have very traumatic encounters sometimes uh, right. for all kinds of reasons. Uh, however, uh, everything I've ever seen, heard, whatever, people I've worked with, there is not as much harm in the entire experience I have with this encounter phenomenon as we do to each other in a single day. Here, here. So there, there, there is not any suggestion that these are uh, the films like Independence Day notwithstanding, mm. there is not a shred of evidence that these beings wish to do us harm. The worst that could be said uh, is what Dave Jacobs said, which is that they are changing our nature in some way, that they are mm -hmm. uh, cohabitating with us in such a way that we are being transformed. But I as far as I could tell, that could only be for the better. Well, Dr. Jacobs did, however, allow for the fact they may not be friendly. That's what I'm saying. In other words, that they may not be friendly. But, I, I mean, he's a, I think his position is rather uh, extreme in, in that respect. And uh, I don't say whether they're good, good, good guys or bad guys. I don't see it that way. Some of the experiences are traumatic and some are transformative in a positive way. It depends a lot on the consciousness of the person having the experience. Uh, in any event, the the fact is that something's going on here, mm -hmm. and it's not 
malevolent in, in the way we are when we uh, uh, make war upon each other or upon the environment. And I can't see that. And I think people, if, if prepared appropriately or just simply told this is what's going on, they kind of know it anyway, you know. And if, uh, if it was presented in a truthful, honest, balanced way, I think the people are much, much more ready for this than the you know alarmists would have us think. All right. Uh, back to the trial concept for a second. Three f- retired federal judges, they'd be a tough sell. I get little computer messages. Bob in Austin, Texas says, uh, Professor Mack, a court will want empirical evidence. Do you have it? Well, this is the old thing. You know, empirical evidence, is, uh, uh, that's the metaphysical question. Yes, there is evidence. Yes, there are cut scoop marks, things on people's bodies. There are some kind of ev- suggestion of implants. There are hints that people are missing sometimes. But the physical, the three-dimensional physical evidence is thin. But what has happened in our world, in our culture, is that we only understand knowledge that is in this three-dimensional physical proof framework. There is the whole range of experiences that people have known throughout history of encounters beyond this three-dimensional world, which we've cut ourselves away from. And that you can't necessarily prove something by the methods of the physical sciences, even though there is physical evidence, I should say, uh, point out, it does not mean that the phenomenon isn't of enormous importance. So if we kind of wait around it to be able to do, you know, as Carl Sagan used to say, we'll wait till the uh, log of the captain of the UFO falls in a field, you know, I mean, that that's absurd. First of all, uh, it takes it much too literally, but also since we're there is so much resistance to even acknowledging that there's anybody out there besides ourselves that uh, the teenage boys that found such a log, for instance, in the field would be uh, psychiatrically examined and uh, accused of doing a hoax, and then the document itself would be looked at and uh, shown to be some uh, ancient uh, thing from a tribe that used to live there. And, you know, it's a, it's a matter of what, what we're able to perceive and take in at this point. And the metaphysical piece, which you brought up several times, has to do with what we feel qualifies as knowledge. In other words, a witness who tells us about an experience they've had which is extraordinarily life-changing and which is not psychiatric with some kind of entity that changed their lives and which uh, follows a pattern that is now familiar to me and to many workers. This is enormously important. Can we prove it by the methods of of three-dimensional science? No. Does that mean it's not of fundamental importance? No. So it, we're going to have to expand our whole way of knowing what in philosophy, metaphysics, as you called it, is called epistemology, you know, is how we know things. We, we mm-hmm. need to find a way of knowing in these interdimensional uh, uh, studies which are as reliable as the methods of knowing in the empirical science field. In such a trial, um, if you were asked uh, what other... Uh, professional witnesses other than yourself would would you think it would be valuable uh, to call what kind of names would you bring forward well I don't want to name names because it's going to bring you know drags people into this right now <laughs> who might not feel ready to be to be you know <laughs> yes uh, I understand fingered like that but okay. I can tell you this the type of people <laughs> you'd want to you'd want a astrophysicist you'd want uh, people of course in the UFO field that have seen the UFOs and have the photographs and the and have done the careful field work about people who've, uh, who've, who've seen the UFOs. People who I'd want to have people that have worked with people that uh, have had the encounter experiences, as well as the abdu- so-called abductees themselves. Uh, I would want to have philosophers on there that can help us think about knowing in a more uh, expanded, intelligent way. Uh, I, historians of science that can look at what happens when a whole new phenomenon has confronted the human species in the past, like, you know, it wasn't until the 18th century that uh, it was officially considered possible that meteorites could fall from the from the sky, you know? That's that, true. Uh, I mean, so, you know, it's, it, there's a, a background to resistance of, of new knowledge in, in, 
in human uh, you know, psychohistory, if you will. I, uh, going back to what you said about the Earth being in trouble, I couldn't agree more. But our economy and the third world nations that are following in our footsteps, well, doctor, they all want what we have. They want, you know, a car, maybe someday a dream of two cars. They want a house, and they want to be warm uh, in the winter and uh, uh, cool in the summer. And, you know, know, basically they want everything we have. And if they get it, then we're not all going to get there, are we? Well... I mean, the whole question of standards of living, does it depend on, on uh, energy fuel consumption and yes. and uh, SUVs that get 12 miles to the gallon? I mean, I my little Honda can get 30 miles to the gallon, uh, which is a third of that, you know, and uh, the, the, is it possible to develop uh, fuel economies or f- methods of transportation and heating our houses that don't destroy the environment at the rate that we're, we're doing. In other words, could conservation, from an energy point of view, that we would, I agree with you, we should take the lead in this, since we're the, we consume, uh, what are we, 3 or 4% of the world's, 5% of the world's population and consume 25% of the energy, something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, I mean, we would have to take the lead in, in uh, you know, uh, what would you say, in abstinence, you know, in, in uh, uh Sort of uh, with reducing our own addiction to consumption. I mean, but, I but don't we're care. not we're not leading though, are we? No, we're not. I mean, but I think it starts at home. We can't sort of broadcast uh, uh, what the rest of the world should do until we begin ourselves to take responsibility as as leaders of uh, uh, some kind of sane behavior around consumption. I mean, I don't hear conservation as a big part of the. Uh, environmental program of this country right now. No. But, no and I'm by a conservation, I also mean at an individual level. So, Actually, our, our entire economy is based pretty much right now on consumption, uh, information, consumption. Uh, we've changed all around. So, you know, bearing in mind that this is the direction that we're headed right now, and we don't seem to be taking many detours, And if this continues and the rest of the world uh, follows us as a model, which they will because, boy, you'd send Hollywood movies around the world and we're the example, we're what you want to be like, then then where are we going? Well, I'm not a social engineer. I mean, I think just more and more people like yourself who uh, reach many people, people right on this subject, I think we... It is... There's this great emphasis on in the economy on uh, growth as a unquestioned good thing every day you read did the economy grow well That's right. think about that growth what does that growth mean does that mean spilling more pollutants into the environment does growth have to mean that can growth mean increase in educational capability can growth mean uh, more uh, value that comes from services can growth mean uh, developing the economy as a service information economy rather than as a consumption of raw materials economy but those questions are not, I mean not, I'm not an economist or a business person but they seem like uh, no brainers to me yeah me too and uh, when I look at where we're headed I think then it's only a matter of uh, how long we can continue on this path and I, I think your 10 to 15 year estimate is a pretty good one that's a short amount of time unless there is some kind of intervention you know, I'm going to be uh, uh, in big trouble at home if I don't tell people if they're what to do if they're interested in learning more about our work. You know, well, uh, of course. Uh, can I uh, give an address? Uh, if people want to write to us, they can write to us at PEER. That you mentioned the program for extraordinary experience research. P E E R at P O Box three ninety eight zero eight zero. Or if they have email to write to us uh, to get, they can get the book you mentioned, Passport to the Cosmos and other information about our work by uh, at our website www.peermac p e e r m a c k dot org. Yeah, we've got a link up now on my website. And uh, your book it, is available nationwide as well in bookstores, yeah, right? It is. And I personally would love to hear from people. At uh, I'm at the Cambridge Hospital, uh, and uh, our, uh, our my own. Uh, 
email addresses. You're but... sure you want to do this? Sure, I'd like to hear what people are thinking about all these <laughs> oh, things. Oh, all right, go right ahead. At uh, polar, P-O-L-A-R, Mac, uh, at AOL.com. Uh, That's and, P-O-L-A-R-M-A-C-K. At AOL.com. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, you, you, you create community, you know, with your work. You, you link people and, uh, and, uh, allow people to have a chance to wake up and become conscious around these things. And I think that any way we can help, you know, to, to strengthen that web of connection that you, you contribute to is, is really important. Maybe with respect to this uh, possible trial that we're talking about for the first time tonight, there's uh, uh, some attorneys. Obviously, this is going to cost money. We don't know where it's going to come from yet. Yeah. Uh, Maybe some attorneys would like to do some pro bono work in this area. Yeah, I mean, Danny Sheehan would know about that, and, uh, <laughs> you know, the whole mechanism of, you know, how to collect the money and uh, how to get people involved in this. I mean, I, I don't know how, you know, this is the first time it's on your show that this subject has really come up publicly, so I think we're brainstorming. That's right. Oh, we are, and uh, I think the audience will consider it as well, and who knows, maybe we'll ask them to help out. Maybe there'll be a financial uh, backer that will suddenly appear magically, and we can do all of this. And it's just in the formative stages, and I don't even know why we talked about it tonight. Well, it might even be a kind of grassroots movement that, you know, people might contribute a little bit of, you know, a little bit of money from hundreds of thousands of people would be, uh, you know, incredible, you know, millions maybe. It would, uh, and I personally, though, as much as I would love to simply have it covered on radio, it sounds like a TV item to me. <laughs> I should, television should be involved. Yeah, I think the trouble is that, you know, in my experience over many years in, in this kind of work is that there's a freedom in radio that TV doesn't have. Oh, uh, you bet. And that uh, the resistance to doing anything wide open like this on TV is enormous. That's been my experience. Well, they uh, like the OJ trial. They'd love this. And and I, I there there are some cable networks, for example, now that really do allow a significant amount of freedom. Uh, not as much as radio, but there's so much reality television going around now. Yeah. Uh, that'd be a hell of a piece of reality TV, wouldn't it? Sure. Well, I mean, that's uh, that's the kind of thinking we need. I mean, and you know, any of us that have connections with uh, people in the cable networks or oh, they're all uh, listening right now. Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, you'll probably get some good ideas out of this. You know, mm -hmm. I hope so. <laughs> I would I would love to allow some of my audience to ask you uh, uh, some questions. Uh, maybe, sure. Uh, maybe, maybe in the final half hour here. Yeah, let's go. Um, but uh, first. If you would, what do you consider of what you have investigated to be the strongest case you've got? Mm, there's so many. I mean, they're strong in, in different ways. I mean, um, in, in your mind. In my mind. Uh -huh. um, As a reasonable person. <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy. Oh kind boy. of a court term they use. I mean, that would convince a reasonable person. Uh, more than any other case, I think that that, that uh, there are several. I, I think that there's one. Uh, there, there are people like a young woman I have in mind who, uh, in her twenties, had just never had even thought about these things, and then uh, just was totally shocked to, to begin to have these beings appearing in her living room, and and was just. You know, terribly upset about it, and and the transformations that went on in in her experience, first from trauma and then from uh, a kind of profound, profound loving connection with this whole uh, this this whole world that that was opened up to to her. Um, there, there are uh, a young man I I think of who uh, was working in a service industry and then began to just. I, I, for the strongest cases are the ones that have no particular relationship to UFOs. They're, they're just out of nowhere. They, they report, they have these experiences, they keep them to themselves. Somebody says, this sounds like you should talk to Mac or someone like that. And, and they say, you know, Doc, I think you're going to think I'm 
crazy, but here's what happened to me. And then what's really powerful is when you say to them, well, you know, I've heard this from other people. This is not, mm-hmm. not, and they, they, they just get, they have what I call ontological shock, which is uh, that everything that they've ever believed is shattered by, by this, and they, they become really upset. And because I can't tell them it's going to go away, and it's crazy that there's something that, that is, uh, they have to, Treat as real, and when you've had that experience with with uh, person after person, you 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 just know that that you're dealing with something that that you can't dismiss. Well, people know they can talk to you. People know they can talk to me. Uh, but sometimes when we stumble into something on the radio, like this simple thing we've called the shadow people, uh, other people come forward and say, "Oh my God." I've had it for years, and uh, they're, they're in tears. They're actually in tears, uh, Doctor, be just so happy that they're not crazy. Well, you know, you've had on your program, you've had Pamela Stonebrook on your program. I absolutely have, yes. And Pamela, Pam, uh, Diva, like to be called, she, she's had encounters with these reptilian beings, and she's had a lot of guts to talk about this because, you, you know, ho, ho, ho. And, I know. And sex with aliens, blah, blah, blah. I know. Well, I mean, her case, which I know very well, I mean, is is a very true and real case and very That's important. Why Good luck, AOL. All right, um, one quick question then to the phones. Joe in El Paso, Texas, asks an intriguing question. Do you think, Doctor, that mad cow disease and all the tales of aliens messing with cows for all these years might have some kind of relationship? Uh, no idea. No idea. I wonder what Linda Howe would say about that. What do you think? Well, I bet she'd be suspicious. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's outside my area. I do think that the, there is a, some evidence that the whole uh, kind of cattle mutilation or these uh, these uh, lights that are seen around the farms when these ranches, when this happens, has some relation to, to this encounter phenomenon. I don't know. They seem to be associated in some way. Mad cow disease, I have no idea. That's one scary disease, and uh, it might answer some questions. Well, anyway, uh, first time caller line, uh, you're on the air with uh, Dr. John Mackay. Hello? Oh, hello there. Oh, hi. My name is Liam, and I'm from Kent, Washington. Yes. And I could easily be in one of your books, and I'm reading the second one, The Passport of the Cosmos, and I find it very interesting. Um, my question is, I've had interdimensional experiences most of my life, but it wasn't until your abduction book that I realized what was wrong with me. And um, It's not wrong with you. Okay? <laughs> I'm saying it quite quote, you know. Um, however, um, I've done a lot of work on myself. I still find it very difficult to get rid of the body trauma. Um, I was pretty, it was pretty traumatic for me, and um, I still sometimes in certain medical procedures and sexually will start having flashbacks. So um, Mm -hmm. do you have any suggestions on how to, even though consciously I know what's going on, my body still goes through the moments and I kind of freak out a little bit. It's a great question. I'm sure a lot of people listening have the same question. Uh, Just for other people's uh, benefit, this is a very physical phenomenon. This is one of the reasons that I took it so seriously is that, that people who have these experiences have intense kinds of oh, yeah, it's quite intense. <laughs> feelings in their bodies. That they, they sometimes will say, every cell in my body is vibrating, or they'll feel that they, that they hold some intense energy that has come into them that they don't know what to do about. Uh, one of the things you could do is, is work with, if you know somebody who knows about this encounter phenomenon but also understands body energies, to get them to work with you and to express some way that you can discharge these feelings, express some feelings intensely. Uh, you'd have to find someone you trust who knows this field. Uh, or you could, uh, particularly if somebody does body work, I mean, you can find body workers who can help you. I've seen a, um, a massage therapist for years. Um, she's not, I mean, she's, she knows about the phenomenon. It doesn't seem, does this ever go away? Is this something I'll have to just live with the rest of my life? or I think that, yes. I, th- I mean, I, we often, <laughs> with the people we work with in 
uh, yes, it, go, it can. It, it can, can go be away. Relieved. Okay. Yeah, that, okay. that the people, a lot of the people we work with, uh, find a uh, very great relief in their bodies with relaxation sessions that that allow their body, the, the body, just to react and to 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 express their emotion with the voice, or let their body shake and let the energy pass through and and move on. I mean, uh, I, I, but you have to find somebody that can can do that combination of of of, of relaxation and really what I call hold the energy in other words uh, really be present to the person as these very intense feelings come through uh, emotionally and physically and I, I don't know where, where do you live? I live in um, Kent, Washington Yeah, why don't, why don't you write, are... write to us and see if we okay. know somebody in your area that uh, might, you know, might be able to help you Yeah, I and mean, they definitely have to be familiar with this phenomenon, otherwise, you know, I don't want to be labeled something yeah, else anymore. Exactly. <laughs> familiar with the phenomenon and no, and no uh, uh, you know, the body, <laughs> no body work. I mean, can can do yeah. uh, um, physical... All right, the answer is... Well, 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 thank you. Can I say something to Art? Yes, sure. Oh, um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I periodically fall asleep listening to your show. Not that it's boring, but it's late. And the last one you had on the um, shadow people was not a good one to fall asleep with because as soon as I got into that dream state, I had a big like TV screen with somebody with bright, glowing red eyes. Okay, well I'm I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> and I blame you for that one. All right, well thank, it can't yeah, be thank the, you. Very much. It can't be the first time that he's kept people awake, uh, or probably influenced the dream state yeah. or worse yet. Uh, you mentioned Pamela Stonebrook. And, oh, was I criticized when I put Pamela on the air. But I did it for a reason. I did it, A, because I believed her, B, because I think there's a whole lot more sexual uh, activity going on with regard to abduction cases than people are ever willing to talk about. Is Absolutely. that... You Absolutely. agree with that? Absolutely. And Pamela is unusual in that she's, she's uh, able to uh, face up to the... Uh, encounters she's had with these reptilian beings, including the sexual aspect of it, tell the truth about it, take the hits and the criticism That's and right. the put downs and all that. She's very gutsy. She, I, I'm, I'm, I've been very impressed with her, and and she's. Uh, you asked about cases before that have impressed me. She's one of the ones that has been very impressive to me. Well, there have been since Pamela uh, many others, so that's an area that just has been way underexplored. All, all right, uh, Wild Card Line, you're on the air with Professor Mack. Uh, hello. Oh, good evening or morning. Morning, probably. Yeah. Thanks for taking my call. And sure. Related. Welcome back. Where are you, sir? I'm in northwest Colorado. Okay. Yeah, KRMR. Um, I listen to things like this, and I'm reminded of a book named The Population Bomb, if I might date myself. Almost none of it came true, anyhow, any of it that really mattered. Um, the, the notion of a static planet, that this planet is, should you know, keep a constant temperature throughout time, seems a little absurd to me. And the last point I'd like to make in this... So global warming absurd to you, right? Uh, not absurd, not totally absurd, but I think that the, the jury's really still out, and the way that it's presented in mainstream media is that it's etched in stone fact and I, I really think that you're well, actually uh, that, you know actually that's one of the areas around the environment that the scientists have pretty much uh, uh, closed ranks on and agreed uh, without exception I mean that uh, there are controversial areas but that's not one of them and, and I think if we if the polar ice caps really do melt and uh, cities are, are flooded I mean that that isn't just about you know having a different temperature Okay. Well, I'd like to ask a question and make a third point vis-a-vis -vis, uh, global warming on my second point. If the ocean levels rose, and that wouldn't that create a larger surface area of water on the planet? And wouldn't that larger surface area give off more water vapor and create more clouds, which would reflect light and cause more rain and cause the planet to cool? And then my last point. Maybe so, but that might be after New Orleans went underwater and a lot of coastal cities disappeared and a few other things that, you, you know, a lot of us would consider unpleasant would occur. But maybe so. Uh, <laughs> well, my, my point being is that the planet may have its own immune system. And the third point being is yeah, that... But it, ne it never had to deal with a species like us. Well... 
Perhaps so. And my third point is is that you call for huge government action. And if I might play Harry Brown for a moment, um, how can you believe that any sort of uh, national, worldwide, global action might be any more effective at stopping global warming than they've been effective at putting out the fires in Yellowstone or putting out the fires in Los Alamos or the war on drugs or the war on poverty or the war on anything else. Well, I, don't, I don't remember asking for a huge government action. I think this is a, a far broader matter. It involves all of us, corporations, uh, all our institutions, government included, all of us as individuals. I mean, these problems that we're talking about, I mean, most of the major problems we face, I think you'd agree with this, are created by by human beings. I mean, and so they are to be, it's only... Well, you see, that is where I think he disagrees. He, he doesn't think that uh, human beings could have an effect on the planet. He doesn't think that uh, any meager little thing we do matches up to anything nature might have in mind. Uh, I never heard that position before. R listen to Rush Limbaugh. Huh. <laughs> East of the Rockies, you're, you're on the air with Professor Mack. Good morning. Good morning, Art and Professor Mack. Uh, where you, where, where, where I'm are sorry, you? Bob in Austin, Texas. Okay, Bob. Uh, Professor Mack, would you have any difficulties in entertaining the following, that these individuals, and there's a link I'd like to propose between NDEs and ET experiencers, that these individuals are experiencing something that is real, but that is so overwhelming outside their vocabulary, outside of any mental paradigms, that it is we who get to paint the picture of the reptiles or Brinkley's Crystal City or the alternative is insanity. Well, if I get the thrust of your question, um, I, 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 I think I agree with what you're saying, which is that there is a link between the phenomenon like near-death experiences, NDEs, or the alien encounter phenomenon, that they have in common an uh, opening up of our consciousness to energies, to realities that are experienced uh, and can be experienced if the person doesn't have any guidance or help as overwhelming. Exactly. That, uh, now, I don't believe that, that that has led to people distorting perception so they're seeing, seeing reptiles when they're really having some sort of vague trauma. I think they're seeing what, what is there to be seen. Uh, but I do agree with, with the notion that part of the resistance to facing this whole thing is that the energies involved are so powerful. They, they are not something that we can, uh, you know, build a bigger astrodome and control. You know, the, one of the, uh, one of the ads on the program had to do with a, a woman saying that she likes red roof because you can control uh, the environment in the room. Well, uh, you know, we have a passion for control as a species, and this phenomenon, uh, the encounter phenomenon, uh, confronts us with the limitations of our ability to control the cosmos, to control the universe that we live in. I'm, I'm continually impressed with how we appear to be so locally conceited in our interpretations, whether it's in Rorschach, photographs from the Mars Explorer, it's, we have a tendency to make things so local, so within our realm of knowing, when someone in science, I don't know who, said nature is far more strange than we can possibly imagine. Oh, yeah, I, I think we, we want to make it manageable, you know, we, want, we don't want to face the mysteries, but, you know, the whole fact that we're here at all and where we're going when we die, oh, there's nothing but mysteries, you know, and... Uh, I think life's a lot more exciting when we open to the mysteries, but, you know, I'm biased in that direction. Absolutely. Well, thank you both. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much, and take care. Uh, I'm certainly biased that way myself, and it's another, that's another one of the great societal denials, and that's death uh, itself. It's one of the greatest of all, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, he mentioned near-death experiences. I think people that open to death through near-death experiences and uh, have a kind of uh, preview of what may be to come, and and they're not afraid whether it's accurate or not. They're not afraid of death uh, by and large anymore. I mean, most of them have magnificent transcendent experience. Some of them have traumatic experiences, but most of them open up to a, a divine connection, and they they just aren't afraid of death anymore. They uh, to, tomorrow night, I'm going to have Daniel Brinkley on. Interesting. Oh, uh, he's a wonderful fellow. And yeah. Dan is no more scared of death than uh, the man in the moon.
He said he was such a badass that he had to have two near-death experiences in order to uh, have him see the divine and uh, change his ways. Well, he's still kind of a badass, actually. <laughs> good for him. <laughs> West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Professor Mack. Hello. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. My name is uh, Gary. I'm from the Seattle area. Hi, Gary. Um, I have a slightly complicated question. I've adjusted it somewhat listening, um, but uh, let me try and ask it and get a response here. Dr. Mack, I've heard you repeat several times tonight, and let me say that I've worked with UFO investigations with MUFON and some other groups mm-hmm. that I've never experienced. But um, I was a little, little disturbed to hear you keep repeating the word metaphysical, and you said several times you seem to think these are physical, but yet you seem to be a little reticent about you know, saying these creatures could be physically present here on the Earth and in yes. our environment. Yeah. And I, it just seems to me there's overwhelming evidence. I mean, we've had thousands of military pilots. I've talked to some of them around the world. We've had... I mean, there was a man in Canada a few years ago. He walked up to a landed UFO and touched it and got radiation burns. I mean, we oh, absolutely no. I think they're completely physical. I'm just saying that that they also open us to uh, other dimensions, and that the if you look at a multi-dimensional universe, or you look at the 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 higher realms of reality, spiritual realms, the three-dimensional world is contained within those multiple dimensions. Oh, absolutely, and I think anyone with a higher intelligence coming here would would have to be aware of that and would, you know, obviously be far ahead of us. There, I've just, It just seems to me at this point we have these poor witnesses out there all by themselves. They have no one in, in our official them supporting them. And as you said, it's a huge ontological shock to them. I mean, huge. I've talked to them. And it just seems to me what we, we should all be striving for at this point is while examining the metaphysical interaction, I think we need to be striving to get our society to admit out in the open officially that this, these things are here and so that these poor witnesses can have some support, and maybe it would, you know, that would shock our society into a paradigm shift. I agree. I think you're absolutely right on, and I think that's the whole idea of this, this uh, tribunal, this sort of mock tribunal to get at the fact-finding hearing that uh, we've been talking about here would be to open this up so people don't feel so alone, so they absolutely. feel that it can be talked about, so Hollywood doesn't can't get off on trying to scare us with these ridiculous movies like Independence Day that, that <laughs> gross millions by playing on people's fears. Let me just say one more statement I read many years ago that impressed me. Carl Jung, who I greatly admire, he wrote in a book once that, and not his UFO book, another one, that uh, he didn't feel that humans would become fully rational or fully appreciate themselves until they actually had a physical interaction with a quasi-human intelligence, he said, from another star system, and I believe that too. Yeah, I mean, who are we? We what, Who are we as a species? What is our true identity? Are we cosmic citizens, or do we only belong to, you know, one state or one company or one nation? I mean, we, 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 we have the next step. It seems to me in human evolution is to recognize, as one of my one of the abductees is well known, Jim Sparks says, because we become citizens of the galaxy. You know, not not just. Uh, you know, kind of parochial characters that think that uh, only my neighborhood, my physical neighborhood counts. You know, I, I think we're much too locally minded. I, I agree with you entirely. Well, I admire you, Doctor. I hope you get this tribunal going. Yeah, thanks. All right. Uh, thank you very much, caller. And uh, promised two hours, and you have given two hours, and it evaporates very, very quickly, Doctor. Mm-hmm. Again, again, your, your book is Passport to the Cosmos. It's available nationwide. Back to giving that out. Well, it, it's not, I mean, I, the, I'm not alone in being able to review what comes in there, you know, but I do want to hear people's reactions to this uh, conversation. Oh, you'll get that. Doctor, thank you. Thank you, here, Art. And hopefully uh, in long form, we'll be doing it again soon, sometime perhaps before the trial. All right. <laughs> okay. Take care, my friend. Thank you. Good Bye. night. Dr. John Mack.